Rahman Rahim. Uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, uh, a rare syndrome and I'm going to try to uh, unmask uh, a new face of this uh, rare syndrome uh, previously reported in the literature. So, uh, at a briefing before starting my case presentation, I'm going to, to tell you that the, the, this syndrome is first described in the literature uh, in 1959. We have uh, now so far about uh, 40 case reports describing the features of this uh, syndrome. And most of our knowledge about this syndrome came actually from the uh, case reports, no original articles or large series of patients describing this syndrome. And it is now considered as an uh, incomplete form of a well-known disease because some of the manifestation of this syndrome is matching with a well-known disease. So it is described now in the literature as incomplete form. Uh, I, I'm not sure it is a rare syndrome or we have a lack of recognition and clinical definition of the disease process at early stage because we see the manifestation actually of this disease, but I think there is a lack of awareness about this syndrome and how to relate things to each other so that we can establish a proper diagnosis and definitely a proper treatment in the proper time. Uh, in this syndrome, we need sometimes a multidisciplinary team actually to take decisions in this syndrome, like the case which I'm going to present today. We have a 35 years old uh, male patient presented in the ER with acute onset of bilateral lower limb pain and the features of acute ischemia more evident on the left side with absent uh, peripheral pulsation dorsalis beads on uh, both sides. And this is definitely uh, acute arterial ischemia in uh, this patient. Uh, in the history, uh, the patient uh, uh, showed bust history uh, highly suggestive of ischemic indications uh, the, regarding the walking distance. And also he has a history of recurrent thrombophlebitis of the lower limb vein. So we are dealing with a disease which is affecting the arterial as well as the uh, venous uh, uh, system of uh, both lower limbs. Urgent Doppler study was carried out for both lower limbs and showed marked luminal attenuation of the great saphenous veins bilaterally with second wall and the area of numb partial compressibility, denoting underlying flip bites without active thrombosis or uh, venous occlusion. And this is very important. We have no DVT, but actually we have venous wall inflammation, which can actually at a time predispose to uh, deep venous thrombosis in this case. This is our number one in diagnosis. Uh, the patient was admitted in our facility for further assessment and investigations and showed elevated uh, uh, ESR, the first hour is 44, uh, elevated CRB levels, uh, hemoglobin level is within more or less normal, uh, YBCs count and bletley count within normal. This initial lab invest investigation, if we are dealing with acute ischemia, we should exclude underlying cause of this acute, uh, acute ischemia or underlying this process, for example, systemic lupus can present with acute arterial ischemia, especially if associated with anticardial libin. Sometimes we can have a hint even from the uh, CBC. If we have anemia, we can go for uh, COMPS test to detect if we have hemolytic anemia, if we have thrombocytopenia or leukopenia, we should further investigate for possible systemic lupus in this case. Also, we have to check for the coagulation profile of these patients. Why young male patient without any predisposing factor develop arterial thrombosis and DVT in this case. So we have to check for the uh, coagulation uh, profile of this patient. And actually, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> it should normal uh, profile and also to screen for homo uh, um, homocysteine levels, protein C and the protein S, which uh, actually has a, a manifestation of arterial uh, from both especially protein C and protein uh, S in this case. This is our second uh, point in the diagnosis to exclude other causes before jumping to the diagnosis of this rare syndrome. Immunological profile should be ordered in order to exclude underlying autoimmune process causing the acute schema like ANA, anti-DNA, anti-cardiolibin, uh, B anca, which is associated anca associated vasculitis, also to exclude any other causes of vasculitic or well-known vasculitic syndrome before diagnosing uh, this patient uh, with this syndrome. 
Uh, D-dimer levels also uh, was ordered because at the time the patient developed some system manifestation and we have initially uh, flip bites in this case. So we have to, to be sure that we don't have pulmonary embolism or thromboembolic phenomena in this case. Uh, normal C3 and C4 level, you know, this is a simple test we can screen because it can classify your patients presenting with acute ischemia. If you find the complement utilized, like this is antigen antibody reaction with complement fixation, likely seen in many uh, uh, secondary vasculitic syndromes, secondary to systemic lupus, secondary to cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, other form of vasculitic syndrome, which can, you expect that the uh, uh, a complement is uh, utilized, and this is usually actually a small vessel uh, vasculitis and not a large vessel vasculitis. This is our <coughs> third item in our diagnosis. We ordered for um, CT angiography of the lower lamb arterial tree in order to visualize what is the exact problem in the arterial tree in these patients. Here we can see that we have aortic artery, aortic artery occlusion, the common iliac, and we can see that the uh, the patient has also superficial femoral and tibial arteries uh, are affected as well with poor distal runoff. This is very important. It's going to show you, at first, it's a radiological diagnosis that we have dealing with extensive arterial disease, starting with thrombosis, involving the major vessels of the lower limb and the aorta itself, uh, the superficial, the common iliac, the uh, tibial arteries. And also it can show up that we are dealing with a disease that affects large and, and the medium vessels as well. So all this is very important in classifying patient with presenting with acute ischemia or suspected vasculitis of the uh, lower limb arterial uh, tree. This is uh, our number uh, four item. Uh, this is our surgical team uh, headed by Dr. El Maragbi. The patient, uh, actually, we take the decision to, uh, to perform uh, uh, arterial uh, uh, surgery, the aim of which is to uh, maintain uh, uh, blood flow to the lower limb because this problematic, if we have uh, vasculites of the vessel wall, we should initiate immune modulatory medication, cytotoxic medication, a large dose of steroid in order to uh, control the inflammation of the vessel wall and manipulating uh, vasculitis uh, with surgery before initiation of treatment sometimes it's carry a big risk but in the other time in the other in the other uh, uh, issue uh, that if we have such a critical ischemia and not we didn't ensure a, a proper uh, blood flow to the lower limb we are going to have uh, ischemia and we're going to have again green and at a time we should initiate also cytotoxic medication so we are going to give cytotoxic medication on area of amputation because you cannot uh, uh, regain again the uh, uh, unviable tissues with uh, gangrene or something or necrosis just you are going to have amputation which is going to be a residual and permanent damage to the tissue in this uh, in this situation so this procedure is done for limb salvage procedure and then uh, as i told you the radiological evidence is very important and actually it's quite important mostly we order for uh, radiological evidence in most cases of vasculites. And sometimes it is the only way to diagnose certain disorder. For example, this patient with uh, arthritis nodosa. Here we can see the uh, nodosa lesions. It's called arthritis nodosa. It affects the uh, renal arteries in this, uh, uh, in this figure. You are going to find multiple uh, nodal lesions around the arterial tree of the renal arteries. Also, sometimes it affects the coronary. It's quite important to know the diagnosis and then you are going to expect which organ is going to be targeted first. You know, if you have body arthritis in those, we are expecting coronary, we are expecting renal, we are expecting uh, 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 mesenteric occlusion and bowel infarction and something like this. So we have to do, know the diagnosis before starting the treatment and know which targets are going to be involved later on in the course of the disease. Sometimes it is the only way also to diagnose, for example, patient who is uh, takayasu arthritis where the aorta and its main branches are involved. And these patients usually have ischemic indication and there is no actual ischemic area or, or gang gangrenous area developed because the, the process is tedious and uh, let many collaterals open. And so the, a little bit you have ischemia, but no actual acute ischemia with uh, gangrene or uh, uh, non-viable tissues with ischemia. We also order for pulmonary CT angiography uh, in this case. 
and revealed failing defects in the lift pulmonary artery lobal uh, segmental branches and subsegmental arterial branches. And also, we, 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 we uh, identified celiac trunk arterial aneurysm in uh, this uh, case. Here we can see the pulmonary CT angiographic finding. We can find the uh, filling defect within the pulmonary arterial uh, branches, and we have the celiac uh, trunk affections here. Uh, we have to see this. This is an arterial, by the way. This is a pulmonary artery branches, and this is another arterial uh, affection in uh, this uh, case. This is our number five in the uh, diagnosis of this case. So our diagnosis is a used Stoven syndrome. Uh, this syndrome uh, appeared to the light for the first time in 1959. It's described by two British physicians who described segmental pulmonary artery aneurysm with peripheral venous thrombosis. Actually, we saw a lot of patients with venous thrombosis, and at the time, they developed pulmonary symptoms, and we are going to find failing defect in the uh, pulmonary arterial tree. And then we go for thromboembolic, rather than looking at this syndrome, or at least to diagnose, or at least to uh, uh, exclude it from the list of the diagnosis, because the treatment differ. In the first case, for thromboembolic, uh, phenomena, we have to anticoagulate the patient, while if we have use Stoven uh, syndrome, we have to immune modulate and uh, uh, anticoagulation should be individualized according to the patient presentation. So we, the patient, our patient received after the surgery oral steroids and we give him Imuran uh, twice daily and we, we, we give uh, anticoagulation in order to maintain the INR uh, from 2.5 to 3. Jospirin as well, in order to prevent any further uh, consequences or uh, coagulation uh, problem in this case. So I'm going to review a little bit the literature regarding the Hughes Stoven. It is, was named after two uh, British physician in uh, 1959, um, uh, Dr. John Hughes and Peter Engel Stoven. They described in four male patients with deep venous thrombosis and segmental pulmonary artery aneurysm in 1950. Now, this is the first report which appeared to the light to describe such association uh, which is uh, named uh, now or uh, 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 known now as hughes stoven syndrome. Uh, being an extremely rare disease, but I'm not sure, as I told you, it is a rare disease or a failure of clinical recognition of this syndrome. We have to look at those patients who develop DVT and the pulmonary manifestation to look at the pulmonary arterial tree. If you are dealing with definite thromboembolic phenomena or we have this uh, syndrome because the treatment is going to differ. We don't have a clinical, uh, uh, we have, don't have criteria for diagnosing this syndrome uh, just by clinical suggestions and is uh, characterized by a finding of thrombophlebites and the multiple pulmonary aneurysm as it was in situ thrombosis. You told it it's not thromboembolic or pulmonary embolism, it is in situ thrombosis due to the inflammation of the underlying wall of the pulmonary arterial tree. I cannot talk about Hughes-Toven without mentioning Bechet disease. This is the, the complete form of the uh, syndrome, which is first described in the literature by the Turkish dermatologist, uh, Dr. Hulusi Bechet, who described for the first time the classic triad with recurrent mouse ulcer, genital ulceration, and iridocyclitis. This is uh, common, and this is the classic triad, which is usually present in patients with uh, Bechet disease, and even included in uh, the uh, criteria of uh, this syndrome. And even the, uh, Dr. Hulusi Beshit received uh, a way of recognition from uh, Turkey by uh, putting his uh, picture on the uh, Bussel stamp in, uh, for describing this uh, syndrome. But today, you know, we have other faces, although described as recurrent mouse, genital ulceration, and I research, that's not, now we know more and more about the Beshit disease. It can affect the skin, retinal vasculitis, CNS vasculitis, venous and arterial thrombosis, pulmonary vasculitis, and the vascular occlusive disease can affect the aorta and the main branches and aneurysm formation in uh, this domain. We are lucky because if you are speaking about pulmonary vasculitis in rheumatology, we have <coughs> two main uh, disease processes, the Bechet disease and the hughes stoven and the ANCA-associated uh, uh, vasculitis. For ANCA-associated vasculitis like Wigner uh, or Sherbus-Strauss, we have a pulmonary infiltrate within the 
uh, uh, lung. And uh, usually this improve after treatment here, we can see this patient with Wegener uh, granulomatosis, ANCA associated, C ANCA associated vasculitis. And this is before treatment, you see the pulmonary infiltrates, which tends to clear after medical treatment with uh, cell sept after one month of initiation of treatment. For, but for uh, uh, pulmonary uh, vasculitis in Bechstein disease, you are going to find dilatation of the pulmonary artery aneurysmal uh, formation and in situ thrombosis within the pulmonary arterial uh, tree. And also the same for who uses Stovin, but a little bit you can find milder uh, enlargement of the pulmonary arterial uh, branches, but if left untreated or undiagnosed, it's going to enlarge and lead to more aneurysmal uh, formation in uh, this uh, uh, syndrome. So pulmonary aneurysm is the best defined type of pulmonary vasculitis and Bechet disease, even it is previously described as mycotic aneurysm during the initial uh, description of pulmonary uh, aneurysm, they, they call it mycotic pulmonary aneurysm because they are very small and tiny and distributed all through the arterial wall. They saw that infectious etiology is the cause of this mycotic aneurysm, but now we know that this is a pulmonary vasculitis, and sometimes the patients may have severe massive hemops and even they may expire during the uh, uh, attack of uh, severe hemopsis and they may, there may be a rupture of the aneurysm, as I'm going to show you in uh, different figures. It's a systemic vasculitis and virtually affect all type and all size of vessels involving the pulmonary artery, veins, and septal capillaries. It, ha it has also been reported that pulmonary artery affected in Bechstein disease ranges from robur, segmental branches, down to the arterioles. We showed early uh, uh, in Egypt the multi-slice CT pulmonary find, finding in among 16 patients with uh, Bechstein disease. We described the uh, uh, chest manifestation of uh, this uh, domain in Bechstein disease. Here you can find the shadowing of the pulmonary artery aneurysm, multiple uh, pulmonary artery aneurysm, and this is a 3D reconstruction where you can see the thrombus lying within the uh, arterial wall in, in two large uh, pulmonary artery aneurysm. Actually. Uh, uh, if we examine the, the whole CT of this patient, you are going to find a small aneurysm along the pulmonary arterial tree, but if left, the, the small one is going to enlarge to be like this size and may be serious with uh, fatal consequences. Here you can see the uh, different sizes of the pulmonary artery aneurysm. If this is left untreated, it's going to enlarge, enlarge, and even uh, like this uh, large leaking uh, uh, pulmonary artery aneurysm with interstitial hemorrhage. This is can cause a massive uh, hemorrhage. The problem is the association with the DVT in Bechet disease. Uh, DVT is very common in Bechet disease. However, pulmonary embolism is rare because the uh, uh, thrombus is tied to and adherent to the vessel wall. There is no tendency for propagation. It is just in situ uh, thrombosis. And so anticoagulation in this patient may carry a risk if we didn't screen the lung. In this case, for example, the patient may expire from the anticoagulation. So if you have excessive anticoagulation, he can bleed to this in uh, this. It is rather now to immune modulate rather than to anticoagulate patient with uh, uh, vascular occlusive Bechet disease. Here we can see the autopsy of patient with rupture pulmonary artery uh, aneurysm. If, if this one is communicating with a bronx, you are going to have a fistula formation and the whole circulation is exposed and the patient may expire from fatal bleeding. So aneurysm formation in the pulmonary artery indicate poor diagnosis for uh, the patients and the, uh, this patient with this condition may die within two years. This is actually the old literature, but I think with the new protocols and new regime and the early initiation of treatment, I think this figure is going to uh, change much during the, in the recent literature. And once hemopsis occur, maybe 50 of the patients may die from uh, within two years despite any therapeutic approach. But actually this is also uh, uh, an old literature, I think the figure is changing uh, nowadays. So uh, the, the issue that really matters, the, the DVT is uh, very frequent in patients with uh, Bechstein disease, and the misdiagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism is very important and critical because if you anticoagulate based on thromboembolic phenomena, you, you have to screen the lung first, and this should be individualized in every case according to the radiological presentation and the pulmonary manifestation by pulmonary CT and geography before initiating anticoagulation therapy. Here we can see in this uh, review they found um, 159 articles regarding pulmonary disease. They make 
uh, uh, they examined the literature, and the author found uh, 598 pulmonary problems in 585 cases, and they found 78% patients with aneurysm have concomitant extra pulmonary venous thrombi or thrombophilipides in patient disease. So it seems an association we should consider to screen the lung if we have uh, DVT or other uh, venous occlusion in patient with Behcet disease. Um, some author uh, published uh, the endovascular, the, they are going to manipulate the uh, pulmonary artery by, by coiling in order to prevent any uh, hemops or uh, bleeding. Sometimes they use invasive techniques in order to diagnose this uh, uh, pulmonary artery and rhythm, which may be that large in Behcet disease. But actually, the pulmonary CT and geography is now non-invasive technique and actually it's going to visualize the whole pulmonary arterial tree and it's going to visualize the lung parenchyma as uh, well. Uh, it's not worth it to say that the management is the same because now they consider Hughes Tobin is in complete form of Behcet disease. So the same line the, using immune modulation and according to the uh, degree or the aggression of the disease, we are going to uh, 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 make our uh, um, uh, medical lines of treatment to control these widespread uh, vasculites. Uh, many of the reports of pulmonary manifestation of Behcet disease also have suggested that intraluminal clot in the pulmonary arteries might evolve in situ, secondary to pulmonary artery wall inflammation. So if you are controlling the vasculitis and the wall inflammation, you are going to have uh, to decrease the size of the pulmonary artery aneurysm and you are not going to have a serious problem with uh, these uh, manifestations. Also, we have a spectrum of manifestation. Although first described in 1959 by just only preferred DVT and pulmonary artery aneurysm, but now the disease with the more case report, it showed new phases of this syndrome. We published early uh, in 2007, the Hustoven is it incomplete? We discussed the issue of is it incomplete Behcet and why it can be incomplete Behcet. We reported two cases in the uh, literature. The first case is the ordinary common scenario where the patient develops uh, DVT and then uh, pulmonary manifestation, and you screen the lung by uh, 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 pulmonary uh, CT and geography, and you are going to find an erasmal dilatation of the pulmonary arteries and the filling defect, which indicate in situ thrombosis. So, it is rather to immune modulate, rather to anticoagulate this uh, patient. But the other case is, is very rare and not reported before, where the patient presented in the ER with FETS and then uh, MRI brain uh, uh, was done and showed uh, sagittal superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So this manifestation is seen actually in Behcet disease before, the sagittal sinus thrombosis and transverse sinus or inferior sinus thrombosis. And in the same time, the patient had the same manifestation with secular dilatation and filling defect within the pulmonary arterial uh, branch. So uh, uh, as I told you, most of our knowledge came from case reports. Uh, you are going to explore more phases of uh, the disease uh, by time. Uh, when I checked my Google Scholar, I found it that this case report uh, uh, cited 48 times now in the, uh, in the literature. Sometimes the case report is very important, like this syndrome, it's a very rare. We have to report this case and we have to increase the clinical awareness to look for those patients with DVT and the pulmonary manifestation in order to diagnose or, or as I told you, to exclude the, this uh, possibility because the treatment uh, lines will differ. So our report is again supported by another report which came after us where they described the inferior sagittal sinus thrombosis in, in another case of hughes stoven syndrome. So the, the things, you know, uh, um, uh, documenting uh, more uh, uh, findings. Um, hughes stoven is it incomplete? This is a big question now in the uh, literature because, you know, we found many uh, thrombotic events previously reported in Behcet disease, now frequently also reported in hughes stoven like inferior and superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, caval thrombosis, intracardiac muller thrombosis, uh, basalic vein thrombosis, portal vein thrombosis, cardiac chamber, jugular vein, iliac vein, femoral vein, all this reviewed by, in this uh, uh, review article, you are going to find a lot of thrombotic events which occur in Behcet disease, known to occur in Behcet disease and well established, now occur in uh, Hughes-Stoven. But the problem is that in Hughes-Stoven, the, the diagnosis is difficult because we have, we are lacking the classic triad, you know. We cannot raise the clinical suspicion that this may belong to uh, Hughes-Stoven. 
So for Bechstein disease, although we can see this uh, uh, widespread uh, arterial affection like aortic uh, artery aneurysm or celiac aneurysm or uh, pulmonary aneurysm, but the patient is presenting typically with the classic feature of Bechstein disease, which is always present. Mouth, gentle ulceration, and iridocyclic. So what, what's going to, to cause all this manifestation except Bechstein disease? But for Hughes Tobin, it's always a hard diagnosis and difficult diagnosis and need clinical suspicion in order to diagnose the case. This is uh, our A team, which the multidisciplinary team, which participated in, in this case regarding the diagnosis, the management, the surgical intervention. And alhamdulillah, now the patient is well controlled with, with good circulation uh, now. And we are in process to publish this uh, article. It's going to be uh, entitled uh, A Case of Hughes Stoven uh, uh, Syndrome in Complete Bechet with Extensive Arterial uh, Involvement in uh, this case. We're going to report that arterial affection can occur in patients with Hughes Stoven because it occurs in Bechet disease and also we have to look at the celiac artery aneurysm and the pulmonary manifestation this is going to increase the awareness of uh, or to put this into the list of patients presenting with uh, arterial ischemia uh, our aim is uh, actually to unmask the true face of uh, this uh, rare uh, syndrome um, i have to uh, this is the first presentation in 2019 so i have to tell you all happy new year may every day of the new year uh, glow with glow cheer and happiness for you and wishing you all the best in this uh, new year and thank you for coming and attention thank you my question about uh, the uh, if there is any investigations for early detection of this disease because you know this is late uh, vascular damage and target organ damage. Yeah. And the second the question about uh, the role of uh, monoclonal antibody in this context of disease. Yeah. We have recently last year a uh, uh, very big trial uh, using the monoclonal antibody for uh, uh, a residual inflammatory risk in coronary artery disease. Without uh, any uh, change in the lipid profile, it showed significant reduction of major heart endpoints like acute MI mortality. Yeah. So what is the role of monoclonal antibody in this context of disease? Yeah, for monoclonal antibodies, we, uh, we, we don't have, you know, uh, something tried in, in this either Bechet disease or Hughes Tobin. However, there is some reports about the use of anti-TNF uh, for treatment of pulmonary uh, vasculitis with large pulmonary aneurysm. And they reported uh, some improvement of this pulmonary artery aneurysm uh, with use of anti TNF, but actually the, the most solid evidence came from the use of uh, endoxan cyclophosphamide to treat this problem. And actually it is very effective in uh, treating these patients uh, without serious consequence and controlling the disease. The other issue is to do investigation, unfortunately, no, you know, the Bechet disease, you know, the, the its manifestations, uh, mouth, genital ulceration, and you send for the ophthalmologist. Uh, yes, I read cyclides. So you go for Bechet disease, but for Hughes Tobin, you have to correlate things together. And even the problem is the, uh, the D dimer, for example, you know, to which we use to exclude if there is a thromboembolic phenomena from peripheral DVT or not. Uh, it's normal in this case with no actual uh, DVT, but uh, what actually, if it is elevated what is the will be the situation uh, and when i asked the dr yasser ragab the radiologist for uh, can we differentiate between pulmonary embolism and in situ thrombosis he told me that usually the thrombosis within the pulmonary arterial branches is adherent to the wall but still we should take you know things you know uh, carefully is this pulmonary embolism or this is in situ thrombosis but if we have venous or arterial or uh, unexplained uh, uh, venous wall inflammation, we should raise this possibility. You know, how many patients we saw with DVT and uh, uh, what we saw that thromboembolic, and it may be indeed Hughes stove because you know, immune modulation in this early stage is the, is the current concept to treat these patients rather than to anticoagulate. Definitely, sometimes you anticoagulate in Bechet disease. For example, those with extensive vascular occlusive disease. We should anticoagulate, but we have to look to the lung because they are liable to a bleeding. It needs individualization. Each case is going to be uh, individualized. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much, actually, for your presentation. Thank you. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Well, already, I think you answered some of my, uh, for my question that uh, usually, of course, we come across many unprovoked yes. venous uh, or arterial thrombosis yes. in this age group. So do you think it is, w or when you think it is worth it to go for and to dig deep for this rare for this rare syndrome? To do pulmonary CT for yeah. example? Is it, is it worth it or? Um, yes, I, I think it, it's, it's worse, you know. I, I saw a lot of patients with this uh, problem, ex especially that if they have um, venous occlusion, for example, patient presenting with extensive DVT of the lower limb and cable thrombosis, for example. Are we going to screen these patients or not? I think it is, it is wise to screen because, um, uh, because we have an association described now when they examine those patients with peripheral DVT in patient disease or who used to open, they found a link or association between pulmonary artery aneurysm and between uh, peripheral DVT. Mm -hmm. It's not always a big aneurysm and the leaking unstable aneurysm. Sometimes it is very small aneurysm with inside to thrombose, but if left untreated, it's going to be larger leaking the visceral wall may communicate with the bronchus we may have serious consequences it may take years before the manifestation where you find patient develop massive hemoptysis and expire during massive hemoptysis and we don't know what's going on except at autopsy finding like which one i show with rupture uh, pulmonary artery so let's screen it even at once you know thank you Dr. Sauer. شكرا لكم